Shalom, this is Roy Blight. I'm the pastor at Messiah House here in Lake Worth, Florida. And tonight we're talking about season of the shofar. We're looking at prophecy that we, you may not see in the Bible, but it sure lines up with the Bible. Of course, I'm talking about biblical astronomy. And we're talking about the constellation Aries tonight. And it's a these these subjects are, are great teaching sermons because the gospel is written in the stars. And we're going to be looking at this tonight because you have to understand that the, everything that is in the scripture is true. The Bible is true. And everything that is alluded to in the scripture, we need to rightly divide the word of truth. So when we look at this tonight, I'm excited because it shows us so many truths and it gets us meditating on God's word in such a way that we realize how big and enormous it is. It's as big as the stars are in the heavens, the millions and billions of stars that are out there. God knows every one of them. He knows where they are. And he knows what their names are because he is the one that named them. So we look to Jesus. We look to Yeshua, our Lord, for the wisdom and the understanding that he wants us to have. And as we study the, the constellations, we see the story of the gospel emblazoned in the heavens in such a way that it's, it's incredible and it's unmistakable what he's trying to tell us. So let us look at this. Let, me, let us go now to the scriptures. And as we, again, we're, this is the season of the shofar, it's important to know these truths because there are signs that are in the heavens and there's signs in the earth. And of course, we study, so you can go anywhere on YouTube, for example, and you can see all kinds of people trying to discern the signs that are in the earth, but there's also signs in the heavens, and we're looking at this. So I want everyone to, that is in the sound of my hearing to hear the message of the gospel emblazoned in the stars, which God has given to us. And we want to look at the enormity of it, and we want to look at the how specific the Lord is in dealing with us and leading us into his truth, his word, his will, and his wisdom. So tonight, <clears throat> I just want you to sit back and let's look at the constellation Aries from where we sit. Remember that the every year, every 30 days or so, as the, as the earth moves around the sun and it's ecliptic, which is the pattern, it's orbit, we find that there's constellations that appear strongly in the sky that are easily read, but not so easily read today because we have things like light pollution. We don't see them as well as we used to. Of course, if you're out at sea or if you're in some part of the of a wilderness area outside of the city lights, you can see them for sure. But they're there, and the, for centuries, for so since Adam and Eve were on the face of the earth, these signs have been appearing. So let's look at this tonight. Remember that the, as we move around the sun, God is telling us the story of the gospel. And as, the, as the, we move around the sun, the pictures that are in the sky show us in God's way what is really going on. And we want to look at this from a scriptural point of view. We call this biblical astronomy. This is not astrology. We're not worshiping the stars. We're not worshiping the sun or the moon or any of the stars. We're looking at God's creation and what God wants the Lord wants us to see in his creation. So we'll everything is involved. The, the planets, the sun, the moon, the stars, the Lord has given it to us, and we want to start there tonight. We're going to look at what it says, the 14th verse of the Bible. It's it says this. Then God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. Now, the signs and seasons are what we're talking about. The signs and the seasons. The Lord has given us signs, and he's given us these signs in, in the, the proper seasons, which is what we're discussing as far as the constellations are concerned. And a lot of time people look out at the stars and they think that it's all random. It's not random. It's very orderly. and God knows exactly what he's doing. And there's 12 constellations in the sky, the Maserot, and we're looking at and what we call this is the it's Messiah's message in the Maserot. The word Maserot, of course, is Hebrew, which means constellations. The same as Zodiac, which is Greek, which means constellations. This is what we're looking at, and it's marvelous in our eyes what the Lord is telling us. So as we venture through this, I want to I want to, you to remember that the Lord has given all of mankind this message. And we need to understand that this message is very clear. 
and we are responsible to, to know his message of the gospel. That is why it's so important that the gospel of Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, gets out to all people. Look what it says here in Romans chapter 10. And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, indeed. Their sound has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends, ends of the world. But I say, did Israel not know? First, Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will move you to anger by a foolish nation. But Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me. Now remember, the Lord our God is speaking through the prophet Isaiah here, and he's saying that he that the people that weren't chosen to be his people, un, not Hebrew people, not Jewish people, were the ones who received this information. How did they receive it? Well, we need to understand they were studying the heavens. These this is referring, I believe, to the wise men. It's it's talking about those who came to worship the Messiah in Israel during the time of the birth of the Messiah afterwards. And they were there because of the signs that they discerned from the heavens that brought them there. They brought their gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And we know the story of the wise men. And why were they wise? Well, I'm not exactly sure about all their wisdom, but they were looking at the signs that were in the heavens. And they were led by these signs by the Spirit of God. And they came to find the infant Messiah. And they did find him there. And we know the rest that's written in the gospel about this. But this is because they were looking at the stars in the sky. You see, the scripture says, the heavens declare the glory of God. It says very specifically, and the glory of God is shown throughout all the constellations, and this is what we're studying today. This, it says in Psalm 19, please hear these words. This is the perfect revelation of the Lord. It says, to the chief musician, a psalm of David, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Its rising is from one end of heaven and its circuit to the other end, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. You see, this is talking about the glory of God that is told to us in the constellations, the message that is given, because all the stars in the skies that are in all of these constellations add to the story of the gospel, the, the creation of, of planet Earth and the world, the, the, the uplifting and the, the making of the church, the, the children of God, and also the second coming of the Messiah. It's all written in the, in the heavens, and this is what we're looking at. And tonight we're studying the constellation Aries, and we're, as we get into this the subject of this constellation, we're getting two-thirds of the way through the constellations now, and so we're seeing some very heavy and dramatic things happening. Now let's look at our magnificent and awesome God as we study these constellations going forward. It says in the scriptures about our magnificent and awesome God, it says in Psalm 147, 4, he telleth the number of the stars, he calls them all by their names. The Lord is the one that created everything. The Lord our God, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, he is the one, he, he tells the number of the stars. There's millions, there's billions of stars, just like there's so many hairs on your head. He knows every one of them. He has that all in his knowledge. And he calls them all by their names. The Lord has named all the stars 
and that adds to this perfect story of the gospel of the of the word of god the bible being uh, portrayed in the heavens themselves it's uh, the prophet isaiah said in, in isaiah 40 26 lift up your eyes on high and behold who has created these things that bringeth out their best their host by number he calleth all by name he calleth them all by names by the greatness of his might for that he is strong in power not one faileth only the lord our god could do something as immense as put all of this into the sky the constellations that correspond with the, the, the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The message of the Bible is perfectly portrayed in the constellations, and this is what we're looking at. Which brings us tonight to our study, the constellation Aries. Now, it says in John 1.29, Aries, of course, is a ram or a lamb. The next day John seeth Yeshua, Jesus, coming unto him, and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Isn't it interesting to notice that one of the constellations is this ram, and it's and it's part and it's particularly looking at this message of the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundations of the world. Remember the lamb that was that was a sacrifice on Passover, and going all the way back through the signs and the seasons that are found in the scriptures. This Lamb of God is sitting out there in the night sky for everybody to look at and to wonder what it's all about. Well, we don't wonder anymore when we start to study and discern what God is telling us about the heavens themselves. You see, the concept of the sacrificial animal goes back to the Garden of Eden. It didn't start with the law or the, with the Hebrews at all. It goes all the way back to the Garden. It says in Genesis 3.21, Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. It was the Lord, it was Yeshua, who made the first sacrifice so that Adam and Eve could have clothes because they realized that they were naked. And so in the Garden of Eden, we find that the entire concept of the sacrifice animal is there. And we see that this has been part of every ancient culture that has been out there. And it goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Now, we know that some have understood it, and some haven't, about sacrifices. Remember, uh, Cain and Abel. Cain's offering was rejected because he was offering the fruit of the ground. And Cain's and Abel's sacrifice was accepted because he made us the sacrifice of an animal, the lamb. And that sacrifice was something that God ordained. So, a Abel's sacrifice was accepted. Cain's was rejected. This goes all the way back. You, I often wonder, why didn't Cain understand this thing? But you know something? Many people misunderstand what God is doing. You see, and this goes back in, in ancient history as well, the, the shepherd kings of, of the ancient Middle East. Just as we've seen a deep hatred toward fish in ancient cultures, which we looked at in the constellation Pisces, the animosity of people against sheep and shepherds goes back very, very far too. This was a this was written by Manetho, an Egyptian historian. It says there was a king of ours, writes Manetho, the Egyptian historian, whose name was T Timius or Nimrod. Under him it came to pass, I know not how, that God was averse to us, and there came in a surprising manner men of ignoble birth out of the eastern parts and had boldness enough to make an expedition into our country, and with ease subdued it by force, yet without our hazarding a battle with them. So he's saying that somebody came to destroy the pagan idolatry that was going on, and this is what Maimonides, who was an ancient uh, a Jewish uh, a thinker, said about these shepherd kings. In this Maimonid, Moses Maimonides lived from 1135 to 1204, back in, the, in, in the, our ancient of times. He was a preeminent medieval Spanish Sephardic Jewish philosopher, an astronomer, and one of the most prolific and influential Torah scholars and physicians of the Middle Ages. So this was Maimonides. He said, after the great flood, during the reign of the shepherd king Set, who was Shem, who's one of the sons of Noah, and his immediate successors, the complete overthrow of the Egyptian gods occurred. So you see these, these ancient uh, battles over idolatry goes all the way back. 
and sheep herders were an, um, that that is why sheep herders were an abomination to the Egyptians going all the way back. And you wonder what would you have against sheep herders? What's wrong with sheep? It's just farming. To us, we don't realize that this goes back to the battle between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, who is who was going to control and run planet Earth. And this goes all the way back to things that were going on in the scriptures as well. It says their temples, according to Maimonides, their temples were demolished and idolatry in any form was forbidden throughout the land. And you, when you think back to Abraham and his life with uh, uh, Sarah and, and the birth of Isaac and Ishmael and so forth, you see how this all takes place because Abraham was a shepherd. It says, moreover, the overthrow of the Cushite dominion, that's northern Africa, and idolatry by the shepherd kings corresponds exactly with the overthrow of Osiris, who was Nimrod, by Set, who was Shem, and with the story of the judicial execution of Tammuz, another name given to Nimrod. Tammuz is allegedly, of course, is Nimrod's son, as told by Maimonides. So he's talking about this great war taking place, about the shepherd kings going after the idolaters in Egypt and northern Africa, and how the animosity between them occurred even back then. And when we look at a lot of what's going on today, these are ancient wounds. These are ancient rivalries. These are ancient blood feuds between these people that nobody in their in a human mind can explain except for they go all the way back and it's very spiritual in nature. And we see this goes all the way back to the time of the flood. And after the flood, when the land of when there was the of the the world was divided into three parts to the three sons of Noah, Japheth, Shem, and Ham. And that's why the land of Canaan is so important to this, because Canaan land was, was a land that was given to Ham, but then was taken by the Shem and was given to the sons of Abraham. When we look at this, you see that from the time of Noah, this is also, when you look at Shem, Shem lived 500 years after the flood. And his sons, they, the, the lives of men started to decrease at that time. Uh, Shem lived 500 years after the flood, and his sons lived, uh, Exafa, uh, Arphasad lived 403, Salah 403, and it got an Eber, where we get the name Hebrew, Hebrew 430, Peleg 109, and it started going and decreasing from there. But you see, these things go all the way back. When, because also remember they were studying the stars even back then and we see that these things have deep deep roots now abraham again was a shepherd and again remember that also god initiated a sacrifice in genesis 15 with abraham that we need to understand because this goes to the foundational roots of everything that we have in judaism christianity and even islam it says in Galatians 3.16, now Abraham and his seed, that's, the, that's the, those of the follow Messiah, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Messiah. And this is the covenant that God made with the Messiah and Abraham, and the, actually it was the father and the son making covenant about the the path and the promise and the the uh the work that the messiah was going to do on planet earth this goes back to abraham who was a shepherd and remember also we see speaking of lambs and rams abraham's ram in the thicket don't everything in the scripture is there for purpose and we see this it says in genesis 22 13 and abraham lifted up his eyes and looked and behold behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns and Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. So this, the central part of this is this ram who stood in for the sacrifice so Isaac didn't have to. But later on, the lamb of God did allow himself to be sacrificed on our behalf. And this is what we're looking at when we look into the sky and we see the constellation Aries. And this is, this is central to the to our Bible message. This is central to the coming of the Messiah. This is central to everything we're talking about. It's all centered on the, the, the good shepherd, Jesus the Messiah, and Abraham, who was also a shepherd, and the raising of sheep and, and lambs. That was an abomination to, to other people. And he asked himself, why is that? 
because it has deep spiritual roots. The, sacri the sacrifice lamb is something that is very central to Christianity. It was central to Judaism. It's going to be central to Judaism again when they start sacrificing falsely animals for sacrifice because Jesus is the final sacrifice for all of us. But understand something. The, the message of this the sacrifice is central to who we are in Christ. That's why we have communion, to commemorate the death, burial, and resurrection of the Messiah. It's exactly why we do it. And it goes all the way back to Abraham. It goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. And it goes all the way back even to the pagan histories of the countries around Israel. It has always been there. So for the record, let me, let me just state, a ram is an intact male. Intact males are male sheep. That's a ram, and they're not castrated. Adult female sheep are referred to as ewes. Castrated males are weathers. Younger sheep are lambs. The Passover lamb of Moses was a lamb of the first year. That's why it's a lamb and not a ram. A lamb is a baby ram. It says in Exodus 12:5. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. So that lamb is, is referred to as it's a young one, young one year old or younger ram, or it's a lamb. That's what makes a lamb a lamb. So we understand that Aries, the ram, we're talking about the exact same thing all the time. And of course, the symbolism is immense all throughout the scripture. Remember the Passover lamb in the Exodus story, the, the Pesach, the, the Passover where they sacrifice the Passover lamb in the, door, in the doorway of the homes, and they put the blood on the doorposts of the houses. This is very significant because this goes back to God reordaining and establishing the sacrifice of the lamb in the houses of the children of Israel. John 1.29 says, this is what John the Baptist was, was saying. The next day John seeth Yeshua, Jesus, coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. This is central to everything here. And the constellation Aries is pointing to this fact as well. So we see that Yeshua, Jesus Christ, is the sacrifice Lamb. And Yeshua, our Lord, our Savior, came and died for us as a sacrifice lamb. And the lamb represents exactly who Yeshua was. He stood as he stood silent before his accusers and all the things. The lamb is very was is very silent, doesn't fight and stick up for itself at all. Jesus, the Messiah, is the sacrifice lamb. He's the fulfillment of everything that God was telling us about. Now, as we look now at the constellation Aries, which the ram or the lamb, it's the blessings of the Redeemer consummated and enjoyed. We are blessed because he is our Redeemer. He died for us as the sacrifice lamb, and we're enjoying this sacrifice, and we're, we're living in such a way that we are blessed by him because he died for us. And it is, it is staring at us in the skies when we look at this constellation Aries, which is the ram. I can, I can only imagine what the devil must think when he sees the stars in the skies and he sees that this message of the ram is there before all of mankind. Every, every year it is always there and you can't get away from it. Now, the second book, remember that there's 12 constellations. The first four books seems to be, the first four constellations look to be like a book talking about uh, the, the Redeemer and all about who God is and all about the creation. The second four constellations appear to be about the redeemed. You and I who believe in God, who trust in Jesus as our Messiah, who are going to bear the benefits of what he has done for us. That's the second four. But the second book began with the goat in Capricorn, dying in sacrifice, yet with a with a prominent uh, dolphin there and the live fish tail. So we see that there's life coming out of death, which is talking about resurrection power. It's talking about what the Lord did for us. He was resurrected from the dead, and because he's resurrected from the dead, we have a new life. 
The goat in Capricorn with the fishtail is, is indicating that those who would benefit would be a multitude known as the redeemed. The, the theme of the fish in the sea is very prominent in the story of the, of the redeemed because we are a multitude of people. We are like the stars in the skies that, that God showed to Abraham would be his family. We are the heirs of that promise that God made. And in the two middle signs, you had Capricorn was the first one, then Aquarius and Pisces. We have these fish presented to us in grace and in their conflict. In the world, you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world, the Lord said. And we see this happening, but we see that God has given us everything that we need to run in this race. He's given us everything we need to be victorious in this race. Now, this last constellation of the redeemed, the last four constellations, the redeemed, now in Aries, we come to the last chapter of the book. And as we have seen, like the others, it ends up with victory and triumph. In Jesus, we win. And he is the Lord of Lords. He's the King of Kings. And he's the ultimate victor over everything. And we are the sheep of his pasture. This is what we're looking at in the constellation Aries. We're looking at the victorious Ram of God, the victorious Lamb of God, who sits there in the heavens, showing forth his glory and his power and his might. Now, the first deacon constellation that we look at in, in Aries is Cassiopeia, which is the enthroned woman. Remember in Pisces, we saw, we saw uh, the woman enchained, but now we see the, the enthroned woman sitting on her throne with the Lord. Then the second deacon constellation that we see is the sea monster, Cetus, which is we'll get to in a moment. And it's the sea monster that is bound up and in chains and is under the, uh, the foot of the Lord, under the foot of Ares. And we see that there he remains. And then the third deacon constellation we're going to look at is Perseus, the, the breaker, the victorious, the victorious Messiah, who is king and ruler over the earth, who has won the victory over everything. And he is being portrayed in the constellation Perseus, which we will be looking at. So as we look at the constellation Aries, we look at the, the, the stars in it. Aries is Latin for ram. It is tele in Hebrew, which means lamb. The brightest star is El Nath. El is a rather generic word and means authority, God, or judge. Nath means broken or cut in pieces or poured out. So you get the idea of exactly who this lamb is, this ram is. And one of the stars that are in the horns is El Sheraton, which means the bruised, the wounded. Yes, this is the lamb of God who, who died for our sins and is portrayed here. And in the other horn, we see the star Mesarim, which is Hebrew, which means the bound. Remember that the Lord was arrested and he was bound up and he was beaten and bruised for our iniquities. And then the third star we, we see also is, is there as well. Uh, it's Mer Messerim, sorry about that. And in Revelation 5.12, it says, saying, with the, all of this lines up perfectly with Bible prophecy and scriptures. Revelation 5.12 says, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor, and glory, and blessing. This is portrayed perfectly in Aries, the constellation Aries. Now, when we look at last week's the, 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 the constellation Pisces, we see that it is connected to Aries because we see that the fish bound represents the children of God, and the, the band that holds them together is covered by the hoof of Aries, and as when we looked at that, we see that the Lord is in control. This Lamb of God is in control of everything that belongs to him. And we see that he's, he's in control of the, the everybody, the those that are walking with him, those who claim that they're from him. He rules everything. And under the feet of Ares is Cetus, the sea monster. And so we see that the, the one who looks like he's been uh, dead because of Put to death by mankind well he's actually reigning and ruling from the throne of god and he's at the right hand of the power of god even right now making intercession for the saints and he holds all things in abeyance he holds all things in his hands 
Everything is under the control of the Lamb of God that rules from on high. It says in Revelation 5.12, again, saying with a loud voice, this is the Aries screaming at us, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. It's all there portrayed perfectly in the constellation Aries. The apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians, and it's talking about communion here, and it's getting back into the same, uh, same subject of the sacrifice of the Lord and what it means to us and what it should mean to us. And it says, when, when he had given thanks, he break it and said, take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And remember that the Lord is the Lamb of God. This is the one we're focusing on here when we look at this constellation Aries. It's glorious. Yeshua, the Messiah, again, is the Lamb of God. He is the authority. He is God and final judge broken for us, the redeemed. This is the, this is the hot topic in this subject because the Lord wants you to see that he is who he says he is. And it's, it's given perfect a substance when you look at the constellation Aries and you realize what is the humble lamb doing up there? Well, this humble lamb represents the Messiah of Israel. This humble lamb, lamb represents the Savior of the world. And all that the message of the gospel is all about is wrapped up in the Lamb of God, this ram in the sky, Aries. And this is what we're looking at when we look at Aries. Now, the remember the Lamb of God, the Lamb is alive, and he reigns on high. He's not just, remember, he is God. He's going to judge all things and is judging all things. He's judging all sin. He's looking at your life. He's looking at my life. He's the one who puts in or takes out the names in the Lamb's book of life. It is the Lamb's book of life. So he is reigning and ruling on high, and this is what we're looking at. Now, let's get back to the first deacon constellation, Cassiopeia, which is the deacon number one, and it reveals the deliverance and blessing bestowed upon the redeemed. This is a glorious subject here because Cassiopeia is, means the queen. It's the, talking about the body of Christ, you and I, and where we're going, and what we're going to be about. You see, it's, Cassiopeia means the enthroned woman the body of Christ, the captive delivered and preparing for her husband, the Redeemer. Remember, as believers in Jesus, we're to be as a bride preparing ourselves for that wedding day when the groom comes and takes us away. That's what it's all about. And this is what is being portrayed in the constellation Cassiopeia, talking about the queen getting herself ready. In Pisces, we saw that the woman was bound. Here we see that the same woman is now freed, delivered, and enthroned, set free. We're not in chains anymore. We're not in bondage anymore. We're set free, and we're, we're on high. We're the bride of Christ, and we're reigning and ruling with our Lord. Cassiopeia in Arabic is El Seder, which means the freed. In the Dendera Zodiac, her name is Set, which means set, or set up as a queen. It's taken care of. The historian Albumazar says this constellation was anciently called the daughter of splendor. That's who we are in Jesus. We are daughters of splendor. He's the groom and he's coming for his bride. And this appears to be the meaning of the word Cassiopeia, which means the enthroned or the beautiful. The Arabic name is Rukba, which means the enthroned. This is also the meaning of its Chaldee name, Dot El Cursa, which means the enthroned. You see, so the so we we saw in Andromeda, we saw that this this was the woman that was in chains. Part of the body of Christ is under great duress right now. Part of the body of Christ is in chains, is underground, is being persecuted, and all kinds of rotten things are happening to many people because they call upon the name of the Lord our God, Jesus Christ. But that's not always going to be that way, because when the ram comes back, when the Lamb of God takes over, then we're going to see Cassiopeia. We're going to see that the woman enthroned is you and I as believers in Jesus. And we see that Cassiopeia sits there adorning herself, making herself ready, just as the bride is supposed to do on 
for her wedding day. This is exactly who we are in the Lord. It does say in Isaiah 61 10, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with jewels. So we see this taking place. And the, even in the stars, we see that the bride is getting herself ready for that great and wonderful day. And Cassiopeia is a picture of this bride. She's indeed highly exalted and making herself ready. She's doing all that she can. She gets it. Her hands no longer are bound. They're engaged in this happy work of preparing herself. We're no longer looking at Andromeda. We're, we're no longer enchained. We're set free. We're the bride of Christ. And we can be as free now as we ever were if, as we walk in the spirit of God. With her right hand, she is arranging her robes, while with her left hand, she's adorning her hair, just as a woman would be doing as she was getting ready for her wedding day. She is seated upon the Arctic Circle and close by the side of Cepheus, the king, in the last constellation. So there, so there we see Cepheus. We see the, now we're looking at Cassiopeia. And it's a marvelous sight looking at her. And in her in her upper chest area is the is the brightest star is named Shadir, which is Hebrew, which means the freed. In her other arm, it's Kaf, which means the branch. You see it very clearly. She belongs to the branch, the Messiah. In her in her upper hand, she has the branch of victory. She's holding aloft. And this brings us to our second deacon constellation. We see that. The Cassiopeia represents all that we aspire to have in Jesus. We're, we're the bride of Christ. That's who we should be aiming for being today. Because as the bride of Christ, we belong. We are somebody. We are very important to the groom. Which Now, as we look to Cetus, the sea monster, deacon number two, this is talking about the great enemy bound. Now, there's some very interesting things here. When John sees the new Jerusalem, the bride, the lamb's wife, it says in Revelation 21.10, Satan has been bound. So, in Cassip, so when you look at Cassiopeia, it is a time when Satan is bound up and he's, he's no longer able to do anything. And this is what is represented in Cetus, the sea monster. Satan is bound. We see sometimes he's let loose. He wants to think he's going to reign and rule, but he's not. He's doomed. He's, his days are short. And when we look at Cassiopeia, at the same time, Cetus... The sea monster is bound, and he is bound, and he's not going anywhere. He's bound up, and Jesus has him under his foot, which is portrayed perfectly in Aries because the, the, the feet of the ram are over the sea monster. Satan is bound up, and he's going nowhere. Remember what it says in Revelation 20, verses 1 through 3. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. So he's bound up. He'll be let loose for God's purposes for a little short time, but it's only because of the judgment that's going to be on planet Earth. But he's bound up. Satan's not going anywhere. He's going to be bound up forever and forever and forever. And this is what we're looking at at the constellation Cetus, the second deacon in Aries. Cetus is the Leviathan or the sea dragon. We see it's a, it's a spiritual entity even today, but he's, again, he's, he's going to be bound up. Cetus is the picture of that, of that it's of a great sea monster. Cetus is the largest of all the constellations, of all 48 constellations. Cetus is the biggest one. So we see that hell is going to be enlarged for these spirits. The sea monster is the natural enemy of fish. Therefore, it is right here at the end of the book concerning the redeemed, we see the sea monster put to shame. It is situated, Cetus is situated very low down among the constellations far away towards the south or lower regions of the sky. So we see it's the very theme of it is down, down low, down south, and you can barely see it, but it's there, and it's the largest of all the constellations. 
and it represents this sea monster that is going to be put into chains forever and forever and forever. That's why we hear, for those with ears to hear, we need to understand Cetus, Leviathan, the sea monster, the devil is bound now when Ares is being portrayed and the, the bride of Christ is being adorning herself. This may be a picture of after we go to be with the Lord. It may be a picture of after the rapture. We're not sure, but it is a future reference because Satan is completely bound during this time. Luke 10, 19 says, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. That's this promise that is given by the Lord to us is for those of us who will walk in the Spirit and who will exercise God's Word and exercise the gifts of the Spirit that have been given to us. So is the future? Could be now, but it will definitely be in the future as well. Remember when we looked in at, at Pisces, the fish was looking at two different portions of the other constellations. And remember, God has given us a choice. You can choose life or you can choose death. And that goes in this life, and it goes into the next life as well. What are you looking at? What are you staring at? What are you into right now? Are you looking at the, the problems of the world and all the, all the uh, things that are chained up and, and are represented in the chained woman? Or are you looking at the, the Holy Spirit being poured out upon the, the people who are, belong to God, and they're feeding at the trough of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God? This is the question that's at hand even today. So is it going to be Andromeda for you that you're looking at? He, those people that are without ears or eyes to see or hear, that's what they're into. They're into the natural things of this world, and they're not feeding where they need to be feeding according to the word of God. Or do you have eyes to see, and do you have ears to hear? Because if you do, you're going to be looking at the, the Lord and what his word has for you and what his spirit has for you, and you're going to have your spiritual eyes and your spiritual ears open. This is what is being discussed, and you will have victory in this life if you walk according to the spirit of God. Now let's look at Cetus and some of the stars and what they portend for us. Cetus the sea, is the sea monster subdued. Satan, Satan's destroyed. Satan's future is very bleak. The, the main star is Mira, which means the rebel, which is exactly who Satan is. Remember, he's the original rebel. Then there, another star is Menkar, which means the bound, chained enemy. You see, it's very clear who this is. Tau Ceti, another a bright star in it is the scattered pearls of the broken necklace, which kind of is interesting. I'm not sure exactly what that means, but it's very interesting. Deneb Kaitos, which means the whale's tail, which is Arabic as difta. It means thrust down also, the, or the first frog, which is also very interesting. This is what we're looking at in the constellation Cetus. This is the sea monster that is under the foot of Aries, who repre who's represented in the Messiah. So we're about to complete book two here. The Redeemer was the first one. We are the redeemed. That's the second one. Book one, the Redeemer. You saw Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, and Sagittarius mentioned. This is the Redeemer. It talks about the creation of mankind and the spiritual battle in the heavenlies and about the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent and all that transpired what we're looking at. Then the second book is the redeemed. And we complete this now with when we complete Aries, the Capricorn, that's that's the, the, the dying goat with the live fish tail, Aquarius, which is the water being poured out, Pisces, the fish, and Aries, the Lamb of God. Those who follow the Lamb of God are the redeemed. There are no other people that are redeemed. There is salvation and no other name given under heaven and earth other than the name of Jesus Christ. And the, the next four constellations are really interesting and very pertinent for the day that we're living in right now as well. The, it's the book three, the last four constellations, is the, the Redeemer's Return. The Redeemer's Return. It's the constellation Taurus, Gemini, Cancer and Leo, which completes the 12 constellations and completes our presentation here. But remember, every, there's so much truth in all of the constellations in so many different ways. It is exhaustive and it's a wonderful study because the gospel 
is written in the heavenlies. So let me give you some cliff notes here about the Redeemer. The Goat of Atonement, the Capricorn, or I should say the Redeemed. I misspoke there. The Goat of Atonement, Capricorn for the Redeemed, slain by the arrow of God, Sagita, the Smitten One, falling, Aquila, and rising again in Delphinus. This is Capricorn. Then we had the three deacon constellations. Then in, Aqu in Aquarius, the living waters of blessing poured forth for the redeemed who drink, Piscus Australis, in the blessing. Are you filled with the spirit of God? The blessed with his anointing brings speedily Pegasus, the good news, Cygnus of the return returning redeemer. It's all there, the gospel of Jesus Christ going around the world being told to people who are filled with the spirit of the living God. We see this in Aquarius. Next, we find, of course, after all of these constellations, we come to what we've been looking at in Aries, which is the culmination of all of it, the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundation of the world. The redeemed, blessed though bound, Pisces, by a bond to their great enemy, the redeemed in, in bondage, Andromeda waiting for the Redeemer, Cepheus, coming to rule. And this is what we've been looking at. We see this, this, this drama being played out in our lives. And are you, going to, are you going to choose life or are you going to choose death? The believer always, every day, has that right before him. And we see this in Pisces. And we see it in Andromeda, then, per, then uh, Cepheus as well. And it is finished. The lamb that was slain, Ares the captive to be delivered, Cassiopeia, and prepared for her and for her husband, who has bound the sea monster, Cetus, who will be broken by, which brings us to our third deacon constellation, uh, Cassiopeia, which brings us to our third constellation, which is Perseus. Perseus means the breaker, the breaker delivering the redeemed. This is Yeshua, and here's a prophecy of the Messiah, the breaker. The breaker has come up before them. They have broken up and have passed through the gate and are gone out by it. And their king shall pass before them and the Lord on the head of them. So we see that Perseus is a picture of he who is known as the breaker, which is a messianic prophecy. He takes his place before his redeemed, breaking forth at their head, breaking down all barriers and breaking the heads of Leviathan and all his hosts. In his right hand, he has his sore and great and strong sword, a big, huge sword. The sword is lifted up to smite and break down the enemy, which is exactly what Jesus has done for us. This is Perseus, the breaker. He has wings on his feet, which tells us that he is coming very swiftly. There's no one faster than the Messiah. In his left hand, he carries the head of the enemy, whom he has slain. So this represents the devil whom Jesus has conquered for your sake and for my sake. And we see this in Perseus. And when we look at the stars in Perseus, it's, a, it's an amazing look at exactly the power and the breaking forth of what the Lord has done. In the Denzera Zodiac, the Dendera Zodiac, Perseus is known as Kar Kanem. It means he who fights and subdues. It, you see the star Murfak, which means who helps. El Ganib, mean, which means who carries away. Athik, which means who breaks. Remember, he's the breaker. He's breaking the enemy. The star in the head, the, the head he holds is Rosh Satan, which means, it's Hebrew, means head of the adversary. And El Ore, o, Ohe, which means is Eric, which means the subdued. Or El Ghul, which means the evil spirit. It's all there. The Lord is going to have complete victory over the devil. And this is what we're looking at in Perseus. And now we see that the Lord's work is complete. The bride is making herself ready. And he's coming back to take his bride back home with him. So this concludes the redeemed, the last four constellations, which takes us into the next, the third book after this, and we're very excited to bring it to you next week. It's Taurus, the bull, and we will be looking at, at all that has to take place that has to do with the second coming of the Messiah. So God bless you. Thank you for looking at this today, and we just want to remember that 
when you understand what the Lord is trying to tell you, everything that is lined up in the Gospels is lined up in the stars. And the and if anything, the stars give us a more comprehensive look at the truths from God's Word, and they help line up the thoughts that He wants us to think concerning His Word. But we are without excuse because His Word has been given to us in the heavenlies, and we want to understand the truths that He has for us, and they line up perfectly with God's Word. We have two great witnesses. We have the Word of God, and we have the God, the, the Word of God the, in the stars in the heavens, which is a great and amazing study. So God bless you. We'll pick this up next week with the Constellation Taurus. Have a great day, and we'll talk to you then. Bye-bye.